Hello there. Good morning to you, good afternoon to you, and good evening to you from wherever you are joining me from. It is Mayegun and it is live. For those of you who are going to be joining me live, especially on Facebook and YouTube. And to those who are probably going to have to watch this later, well, one of the books recommended their books to be read on uh, this platform, historical. Uh, the second one, the first one was uh, a fatherless people. The secret stories of how Nigerians missed the road to the promised land. And the second book is the famous Why We Struck, the book that majority of the people who have come across it, eh, they have acknowledged as one of uh, the reputable, reliable accounts of what really happened or what led to what happened on the 15th of January, 1966, Nigeria's first military coup d'etat. So without much pompere, eh, we will start eh, from chapter, I mean, chapter one. And if you are joining me right now, I know it can be a little bit boring or maybe not so interesting for some, and uh, maybe some level of a historical shock for others. But the part is that if you have time to listen in, eh, it's such a pleasure, okay? And I'm trying to see if I could like, uh, you know, I wish I had a stand in front of me that I could just like glance and like that. So I could, I could keep eye contact. I don't think that really matters. So I do suggest, right, if you have, uh, if you are really somebody who is busy now, you can listen to this like a podcast, like audio podcast, where you don't really have to sit and watch. Anyway, good luck to us. So we're going to take from uh, chapter one, and this is a book that's, uh, you know, pretty much uh, extensive, I will say, but well, let's get to it. Uh, again, thank you for joining me, okay? Why We Struck by Adewale Ademoyega. Chapter one, the political prelude. Nigeria's political problems sprang from the carefree manner in which the British, the British took over, administered, and abandoned the government and people of uh, Nigeria. British administrators did not make any effort to weld the country together and unite the heterogeneous groups of the country, I mean, of the people, rather. This does not imply that British administrators did nothing good in Nigeria. Far from it. Many things stand to their credit, and it is clear that present-day Nigeria owes certain achievements to the spade work of British administrators. Nevertheless, there was one evil that outlived British administration, namely political non-advancement. When the British came, they forcibly rubber-stamped the political state of the ethnic groups of Nigeria and maintain that status quo until they left. Upon their departure, nearly a hundred years later, the people resumed fighting for their political rights. When the British came to Nigeria as an imperial nation to take over the rulership of the country from 1861, with this, uh, I mean, we know with the session of, I mean, sorry, with the session of uh, Lagos, 
they met the people of the South totally free, only observing and regulating their own monarchies and institutions. But in the North, the British met the Fulani in the process of establishing their rulership in most parts, except in the Kanuri area in the Northeast. The gradual but continued establishment of Fulani rulership over the former independent states, such as the Ausa, Birom, Anga, Nupe, Sivi, and the Yoruba of Ilorin started in 1804 in Gobir, Shokoto, with the rebellion of Usman Danfodio. It was by the, and by the success of that rebellion alone that the Fulani, who formerly dwelt as strangers and settlers among the various peoples of the North, began to unseat the traditional rulers of these people and imposed members of their own clan as rulers, styled emirs. They demolished the free monarchical institutions of these people and imposed on them as Islamic oriented but feudalistic rulership. It was this rulership of the emirs and their kinsmen that reduced the northern peoples from their erstwhile free and happy landowner farmer states to an oppressed landless serf state in which they had to pay 60% or more of their food crops, cattle, and other products to the village head, district head, and the emir in political homage. In addition, those of them who had accepted Islam had to worship behind the said political leaders in religious homage. In that way, the Fulani aristocratic feudalism was established in the North. It is to the discredit of the British that they, who understood the, principle, the principles of personal liberty and who had nurtured the ideals of social justice for 1,200 years still came to Nigeria in the latter part of the 19th century simply to bolster up the forces of feudalism and so prolonged the oppression of the people. As was traditional, the peoples of the North did not meekly give in to the rulership of the Fulani. They strove hard to pull down the strange rulership, especially because it completely took away the political freedom to which they were accustomed. Unfortunately for them, the, the British came in, I mean, sorry, the British came in at that particular time with a superior military force and imposed the peace of Britain, rubber stamping the Fulani hegemony over the whole area. After that, the, no, sorry, after that, every effort by the people to be free was regarded as a rebellion against British rulership and was forcibly suppressed. From this, we can easily understand why there was a fundamental difference between the political aspirations of the leaders of the North and South. In the South, political leadership sprang from the people, that is, from the grassroots. These people had been the custodian of their own civic rights before the British came. It was easy 
and natural for women, I mean, for common people to be active again. When political agitation for national freedom became a popular preoccupation of Nigerians in the 1940s, in the North, however, the ruling class, <clears throat> made up of the sons and kinsmen of the emirs, took over the political leadership of the people. Unfortunately, they represented their own class interests rather than the popular will of the masses. This happened because the British governed Nigerians indirectly through their traditional rulers. In the South, they governed through the Obas, Obis, and Amayanabos, who were relatively powerless amongst their people. In the North, they governed through the Emirs, whose sons and kinsmen were the chiefs and native authority officials, who lorded it over the people. These emerged as the aristocratic political leaders of the 1940s. As a result, the true leaders of the masses were unstrung and held down. So British concepts of tripartition, so from the, onset, from the outset, the British governed the North as a monolithic unit. Imagine the separate kingdoms of Ferbono with the Fulani Emirates. They also governed the South as a unit until, Rich I mean, until the Richards Constitution of 1946, which splits the South into two, establishing a country with three large regions. From these, three centers of power were established. Kaduna in the North, Ibadan in the West, and Enugu in the East. Each region was administered from its center of power by British representatives called Lieutenant Governors. The overall coordinating center was Lagos, where the governor resided. This was the pattern that led to the independence of Nigeria. With the calling forth of regional representatives to the Constitutional Conference that followed, the political leadership of the country split into three so that the British motive of divide and rule was exemplified. It must be noted that this political arrangement by the British was not necessary. They could, for instance, have carved out a region for the Kanuri in the Northeast. Since that area was never captured by the Fulani, they could also have carved out a region for the Yoruba of Ilori and the TV of the Benue since their areas were geographically and ethnologically distinct from the Aousa areas further north. However, the British chose the tripartite arrangement because it was more to their purpose of keeping Nigeria perpetually within their sphere of influence, even after independence. A quick one, guys. If you are listening in, especially if you are listening in on, uh, on Facebook or YouTube, the audio is so very much important. You need to let me know if the audio is perfect. And I'll keep checking. The reason is because I could be so soaked in into reading this that I may not even read comments or look up or do all that. Eh? So please let me know if our audio is great. So my friends on TikTok, sorry that uh, it's almost the same. Your own audio is pretty much perfect. Eh? You're just listening in. That's what it is. All right? Thank you. Now let's uh, proceed. And also, another question. Is the reading and the rhythm of the reading manageable for you? Not too fast, not too slow, or what have you? And clear. Also, let me know that too. Eh? Thank you. And as you are joining, just remember to share the broadcast. A lot of people have heard about this book. A lot of stories have been made up about the first school in Nigeria. 
the Igbos have been blamed for the coup. And a lot of you grew up believing that Igbos planned the first coup, and that was what led to the, uh, the Cold War that uh, the Nigerian system is uh, foisting on them. So indeed, it has to be clear. It has to be kind of uh, understandable. And I'm going to need your help doing that. You see, I've not got my headphones on. So I want to believe that uh, if you say it is perfect, then we can proceed. Thank you. Here we go. So, see this man. It's a popular face, right? Eh? Sadauno of Shokoto. So that is uh, Alaji Amadu Belo, the Sadauno. So, uh, let's continue, rather. So for them, Amadu Belo uh, is a crown prince, sort of, okay, of Shokoto. So he emerged as the leader. He came from the ruling class, the stock of the emirs. Therefore, he represented his class interest. In the West, if Obafemi Awolowo, a lawyer, and in the East, Dr. Namdi Azikiwe, a journalist, emerged as leaders. These three personalities held sway as the leaders of their political parties, which had gained power in, uh, in the North, inclusive of the Northern Cameroon, and was in charge of the regional government. If Awolowo led the action group, which was the dominant party in the West, inclusive of Lagos, while Dr. Azikiwe led the National Council of Nigeria and Cameroon, NCNC, which had gained power in the East, inclusive of Southern Cameroon. This was the position in October 1953 when the federal constitution was first introduced into Nigeria. As it was, each of the three governing parties had opposition parties in their respective regions. In the north, opposition to the NPC oligarchy had started to rear its head in the form of two political mass movements, the Northern Element Progressive Union, NEPU, which was based mainly in Kano and Kaduna and was led by a school teacher, Malam Aminu Kano, and the United Middle Belt Congress, UMBC, which was a merger of both the Middle Belt People's Party and the Middle Zone League. It was based in the Benue and Plateau provinces and was led by another school teacher, Joseph Parker. This latter party was foremost in agitating for the Middle Belt states, which was sought to be carved out of the Northern region. It was because the UMBC saw the action group as a paramount advocate for the creation of the proposed state that the property was in alliance with the AG. In the West, the opposition party was the NCNC, the policies of the party differed from the action groups only in the sense that it stood for a unitary rather than a federal constitution for Nigeria. In the East, the opposition parties were the action group and the United National Independent Party, UNIP, a breakaway, I mean, a breakaway faction of the NCNC. Between 1953 and December 1959, there was no constitutional advancement in Nigeria because the British held firmly to their constitutional framework of a tripartite Nigeria. Secondly, the regional political leaders initiated their own concepts of rulership 
in their respective areas of government. Thirdly, the same political leaders strove to keep their old on their own regions. However, while two southern leaders aspired to gain followership in the other regions, the northern leader only strove to keep his firm grip on the north. How could such a grip alone ensure his political aspirations? The answer to this question could only be found in the Repartition Act. By this act, the British deliberately placed a greater uh, percentage of the land and people of Nigeria in the north, putting the percentages of population at 54.5% north. 20.0% west, 23.0% east, and 2.5% southern Cameroon, which was then part of Nigeria. As a result, the British gave the North 55% of the federal constituencies, which ensured that if the NPC succeeded in maintaining its hold on the North, which, is act which it actually did, with the active support of the British, it will be in control at the federal level. Thus, the stage was set for the federal election of December 1959, which was meant to usher in the political independence of Nigeria. The result of that election were a foregone conclusion. The NPC won 100 and 48 seats, the NCNC and the NEPU, 89 seats, and the Action Group and UNBC, 75 seats. This result showed that the effort by the Southern leaders to gain followership in the North had succeeded to some extent. They also showed that the masses of the North would not go with the NPC oligarchy if they were allowed the freedom of political expression. Again, the results showed that if the political parties of the South joined hands together and tactfully worked out their fortunes with the political mass movement of the North, a political alliance would emerge, which if adroitly led, would gain power at the federal level. Although Shifaulowo had agreed to make the NCNC the senior partner in an alliance of the Southern parties. Dr. Azikiwe did not seize the golden opportunity to install at the federal level, a government of progressive forces of the South and North. Of course, NPC did threaten that if the Southern parties allied to capture power at the federal level, the North will secede from Nigeria unless the British were prepared to back it up with their own superior force of arms. Did you hear that? Eh? Good. As it happened, the ready British deposition to back up the NPC, coupled with the latent antipathy of some NCNC leaders against the action group, led the NCNC to team up with the NPC to form the government in December. 1959. The NPC became the senior partner in that government, and the deputy leader of the party, Alaji Abubakar Tapawa Balewa, who had led the NPC at the federal level since 1954, became the first prime minister of Nigeria. The NPC shared the ministerial appointments with the NCNC, which selfishly abandoned its northern ally, the NEPU, NEPU, so that the latter took no part in the running of the federal government, the first betrayer. Then, independence. At independence, Dr. Namdi Azikiwe, who gave up his premiership of Eastern Nigeria in 1959 in order to lead his party at the federal level 
was sworn in as the first indigenous governor general in place of uh, the outgoing British incumbent, Sir James Robertson. Chief Awolowo also gave up his premiership in the West in 1959 to lead his party at federal level. His party did not join in the coalition government at the center and he emerged as the leader of the opposition in the federal parliament. But the Sadauna of Shokoto, who did not give up his premiership of the North and who did not seek to lead his party at the federal level, remained the premier of the Northern region. In the West, if Akintola, who was the deputy leader of the action group, became the premier of uh, the regions from I mean, of the region from 1959 while in the east deputy leader of the ncnc dr michael opara became the premier and so when the independence of nigeria was ushered in on october 1st 1960 it seemed as as if the political arrangements in nigeria had been fairly and equitably settled. Actually, a time bomb had been buried deep into the foundation of the political edifice. So, with the passing of time, the bomb was bound to blow up the whole edifice, unless it was def I mean, defused by a cautious operation of the delicate tripartition upon which the edifice was laid. While it seemed as if each of the political leaders wanted the edifice to remain intact, it could be seen that the parties in the South had hoped that the edifice would be preserved by their own progress in gathering more followership in the North. But the NPC held the opposite view that the edifice would be preserved only if it kept the North permanently in its hands, while it sought to control the South through allies or agents. The first few weeks of independence witnessed an apparent calm in the political atmosphere of the country, which seemed to hugger well for the peaceful development of the nation provided that those who made the laws of the land were prepared to abide by the, time, by the terms of their own laws. There was reason to be optimistic that all would be well with Nigeria. At any time, in the affairs of men, it is not the law that enforces itself, it is the people. If the rule of law was to prevail, the rulers of the people must be prepared at all times to live above board. They themselves have to be scrupulous in observing the law, which is the very basis for the continuity of the society. The constitution which ushered in Nigeria independence had provided for a ruling government and alternative government in opposition. The Government was to rule according to the law, while the opposition was to check the excesses of the government. The responsibility devolved on both sides to observe the law of the game for the sake of fair play and acceptability by both parties, or both sides. The first test of the sincerity of the NPC-controlled federal government came in March. 1961, when the figures of the newly conducted census started to trickle out. The figures revealed that the South had a higher population than the North. If those figures had been accepted by Balewa government, the consequent readjustment of the federal constituency would have put more federal seats in the South. It would therefore have become possible for either of the parties in the South to emerge as a senior partner in any future coalition government, which would embrace, sorry, which could embrace even the NPC. 
But the NPC filmed as such a possibility, and the Balewa government proceeded to reject the census figures completely. It went further to schedule a recount for 1963. Thus, it was being made clear that the ruling NPC would not take kindly any erosion of its power, no matter how legitimate the erosion might be. Also, by March 1961, the Balewa government had passed into a law, a banking act, which was meant to strike at the basis of existence of the National Bank of Nigeria and similar banking institutions. If the law were to take effect, it, it would immediately destroy the National Bank of Nigeria, as well as the finances of the Western Nigerian government, which at that time was controlled by the Action Group, the party that was in opposition in the federal parliament. But the aggrieved parties, the owners of the National Bank of Nigeria, went to court. Fortunately for them, the federal court presided over by Justice Daddy Onyama ruled against the federal government and declared the law null and void. The National Bank was saved, and with it, all indigenous banking institutions in Nigeria. But the judiciary that gave the ruling 